34. You know, we live in a world that is woven with worries and we're weighted down with fears in our life. Um, we just came through all the hurricanes and stuff like that. And I know a lot of people have anxiety about those kinds of things, right? But there is an unwavering truth that we can cling to. There is a hope that you and I can hang on to. And, and, and here's the thing that I want you to, if you don't know this, that God has a boundless, boundless love for you and I. That His love, and we just sung about that, His love is, is, is unmatched. Matter of fact, not only does He have a boundless love, but He has a boundful love in the fact that uh, he, he has provision for His children. And the Bible is very clear on that. In Romans 8, 32 through 34, there are three foundational, what I call foundational facets, I guess, uh, of, of God's generous provision through Christ that you and I can have this unshakable security. Now, does that mean there's times in our life when we don't have, uh, or that we can overcome fear? Or, or that we don't have fear. There are going to be times in our life that we are fearful. Paul dealt with that at times, and so did other people in the Bible that had some fear, but it's not a fear that uh, is a detrimental fear. Uh, there are things, uh, I, I am thankful that we have uh, the sense of fear. Uh, I'm not going to walk on the edge of a skyscraper that's about 300 feet off the ground. I'm not going to get close to that edge if there's nothing to hold me up there. But that fear is going to kick in, and that's a that's a good fear because you know we don't we don't want to fall off of something, right? And uh, and so uh, fear in itself can be good in that it protects us. But there is a fear that numbs us. There is a fear that overwhelms us. There is a fear that overcomes us. That that really that that goes against the unshakable security that we can find in life. Not necessarily from a particular event, but life itself. And that's the security that God gives us in life itself. And so with that being said, I want to share with you this certainty of Christ's care. How do we know, how do we know if we are Christians? How do we know that, that Jesus is going to take care of us? Where's the words on that? Well, where's the scripture that backs that up? And the, the security of our salvation, what does that mean? So again, we're in Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 32 and go through verse 34. As always, I ask you to rise to your feet as we pray tribute to the reading of God's word. Listen to these words in these three verses. In verse 32, it says this. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come today on this glorious day, on this fifth Sunday, where we can come and share in the Lord's Supper and fellowship around the table. God, I pray today that as we share from your word, that God, it speaks to our hearts, that we are Christians, dear Heavenly Father, that we, that, that we have this certainty of Christ's care, that we understand our security and salvation. God, we thank you that you loved us that much. Just be with us, watch over, care for, and keep us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us in these verses that, that there is a priceless provision that, that God has given to you and I. Those that have put our faith and trust in Jesus, uh, matter of fact, I want you to understand in the phrase uh, that is used there in this verse 32, read it with me again. It says, He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. Let's just stop right there. Matter of fact, the word deliver right there actually means to turn over to like a police, to turn over to a police force, to deliver one that would be condemned, to turn over one into the, con uh, the custody to be punished. That's what that phrase means there, that God literally turns Jesus Christ over to be punished for you and I. And so you might want to underline that word there in verse 32, delivered, because that's what it means, that he literally was uh, uh, delivering him, he was turning him over into custody to be punished for you and I. And so I want you to see this priceless provision of the Father, that Jesus Christ becomes the ultimate sacrifice. 
Matter of fact, there is no sacrifice that could have met what Jesus Christ did on the cross. There were two other thieves that died with Jesus, but yet they wasn't sacrificing uh, for you and I. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, had no sin in his life, put our sins upon his shoulder, and, and, and he died uh, uh, for you and I. I want you to see what the Bible is sharing here, is that there was a magnitude of love, that it wasn't just a love. But the Bible tells us that God so loved, that, that, that two little letters, so loved, uh, says that God loved the world more than anyone else. That God had a magnitude of love, that, listen, that, that Jesus Christ did not die as an example. You know, there were people in the Bible who died as an example to you and I, how to live our life. And, 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 and so we can see by their life how they lived and how they died. It gives us an example. But I want you to know that he didn't die for an example. No, that he literally died for you and I. He wasn't an example of how to die. He was an example of death, but that his death literally was for you and I. Matter of fact, it was the cause of redemption. Notice it says there that God did not spare his own son. He did not spare him. He did not uh, again, that, that God would give a lavish gift like his son. In other words, there is nothing greater that the Father could give to mankind than his son. That's why it was a price provision for you and I. For I will share this. Had there been anything more valuable than the death on the, uh, of Jesus Christ on the cross, God would have done that. But because Jesus Christ died for you and I, it shows that it was the, the ultimate plot price. It was the cost of redemption for you and I. It shows that magnitude of love. That's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so this cost of redemption that we see. And so what makes Jesus law, uh, Jesus dying on the cross so different? Again, I said, I said that there were two others that died on the cross. I mean, if it's just dying on the cross, uh, there were a lot of people who was executed on the cross. But I want to carry you back to the majesty of the life of Christ. What Christ did before he goes to the cross. So the majesty is that he is is, is seen and, and was the, uh, the the perfect or perfection of power and life in, in, in the example of his life. And so there was no one else who had ever went to the cross that lived in the perfection that Jesus Christ lived. So therefore you see the value of the life of Jesus Christ, not only that he's the son, not only that he is God, but it is a perfect life. And so a perfect life then is given for the most sinful world. And so now you see why the value of Christ's life uh, what the value of it was when he goes and dies for you and I. It was the majesty of the life that he lived. It was that he was God himself. He was without sin. He was that perfect life. And so if it was a perfect life, then he becomes uh, the perfect sacrifice. He is the ultimate sacrifice. So God could give nothing else. It was only in the perfection of Jesus. And so uh, we find then that the intentionality of the deliverance of this life, the intentionality of the plan of God for you and I in giving this perfect life, it says this, it says, but delivered him up that God had the intentionality of taking this perfect life, uh, this, uh, this perfect plan, this perfect sacrifice, and intentionally put it on the cross uh, for you and I. And so we find the intentionality, the intentional delivery of this, but delivered, again, what does that word delivered mean? That he, he, he handed him of, like handing someone over to the police to, to, to be punished, to be locked up, to be dealt with, that justice may be served. And so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what the word means there. So he, he delivered him up for, notice this, for us, how many? For us all, that verse 32. And so what I want you to see is that Jesus Christ going to the cross is not happenstance. It is a divine design of deliverance. That God had this divine design that this uh, perfect sacrifice, that this perfect life would be given for you and I. And it was from the foundation of the, of the world. Matter of fact, this is the blueprint that God had, had drawn. It is the blueprint that God had created for salvation uh, for humanity's sin. This is the way that that it was going to be. It took a, a, a perfect sacrifice. And so as we come on this uh, on this Lord's Supper, we're going to partake in this 
perfect sacrifice when Jesus said, it is my blood. When Jesus Christ said, it is my body. It is that body that had lived that perfect life. It is that blood that cleanses us, that cleanses us, that perfect blood without sin, no tainted blood. And Jesus Christ that would cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. This intentional delivery, this div uh, divine design of deliverance. Matter of fact, we see the how, how inclusive this blood was because it said that God and his design delivered this perfect sacrifice, this perfect life, put it on the cross to die for the way of sin is death to pay the price for you and I not to die as an example but to die for you this is his plan and when he did that, uh, uh, that that he did it not just for one but for all of those who would come to him and cry out to a God notice uh, what it says he delivered him for us all and so this inclusive Christ sacrifice this gift of grace for every soul irrespectable of our past it doesn't matter about our past because the blood of Jesus Christ at the time of salvation would take care of even the vilest of our vilest of our past. And so what a plan it was. And so we have this intentional delivery. But not only that, but the abundance of it. I want you to see what the, the writer in Romans uh, shares here. Paul shares with us the assurance of the abundance for he comes on in that verse 32 read it with me he that spared not his own son but delivered him again what does that word mean delivered him for uh, for us all and then he goes on and he says this in that verse 32 how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. What a, a great statement to be made there. This assurance that those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we have an abundance. Now, what is that abundance? What is the logical conclusion that we can come to? Well, since he gave us the greatest gift, if he has given us the greatest gift, why wouldn't he want to give us everything under that? If he has provided for us, I want you to see, he says that God had given the greatest gift for you and I. So if he's given the greatest, why would he be willing to give us anything under the greatness of that? And so that's why he says in that verse 32 there, he says, he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, if he gave him, and he's the best gift, he's the greatest gift. Well, if he's already given you the greatest, then anything under that, why would he not be willing to give you that? If he's already given you the greatest. See that? Now he says he, that, that he shall give him not with him. Also freely give us all things. And so we find in this logical conclusion. Understanding that this is what the writer is telling us. This is what Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is telling us. Y'all know that God is a gracious God. And that's what he is saying here. That God is a gracious God. And that we need to understand God's generosity. Uh, generosity. He gives us lavishly without any reluctance. God is not reluctant. Sometimes we're reluctant in our gift giving. We don't know if it's the right gift. I don't know if I've given the right thing. I, I don't know if I bought the right thing. I, I, I don't know if they deserve this. I don't know if they deserve this amount. And yet God does none of that. He literally gives to us graciously. And I, I'm going to talk about this just a minute here about these things uh, that it's talking about here what what is this abundance that he gives for you see we all recognize Christ's connection to blessings and we know here that there is a link between salvation and and, and our daily life and and daily blessings in our life and so when we, when we read these words and we think how God is giving, that God is a giving God, that God is a generous God, we always come to this conclusion of things. We come to our daily provisions. We come to daily life. But here's what I want you to understand too. That's not that, that's just one side of the coin because I believe also here's what it's talking when it says that he freely gives us by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the power of Jesus Christ. Not only does he give us things and, and blessings and life and he breathes in us through that, that abundant life, but he freely gives forgiveness in all things. 
I, 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 I don't believe I'm reading anything into that. That God gives us all things. And, and part of those all things that are freely given unto us is that, is that, that forgiveness of sin when we can come and cry out and we can apply the blood of, of Jesus Christ into our life that he, that he freely forgives us all things. And so when that happens, we end up with special treasures in our life like salvation and joy and peace and strength. And all of that comes by the Spirit as God is giving and doing and working in us all things in us. Not just material things, not just blessings that we can see tangible, but what God is doing on us on the inside. That we have the freedoms of gifts that He gives freely gives us all things, the freedom of gift, that joy and peace. And I love that fact that God's, uh, that salvation in us uh, is working on the inner person so that we find strength through the spirit. Uh, matter of fact, we find God's faithfulness. I love this, that, that he freely gives, shows us that God is faithful in our storms. God is faithful in our needs. Uh, God is faithful in, in the time of mercy. God is faithful in a time of forgiveness. God is faithful. He is fulfilling everything that we need uh, on the inside of us daily in our life so that salvation is doing a work in us every single day. And so we have this freedoms of gifts that God gives. What does it say? How shall he not then, if he's given us the ultimate gift, how, he, how shall he not bless us? How should he not forgive us? How should he not share uh, a mercy and grace and, 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 and help in time of need? Freely give us all these things, all things. Not just these things. He says all things. That he gives all things in our life, whatever there is that is lacking. And then we find this unwavering justification of the elect. I love this, verse 33. Who then shall, if God has given us, and God is giving us grace and mercy, and God is helping us in our trials, and He has freely given us all things that are needed, uh, He is doing the work in us, then verse 33 says, then, well then who shall lay then anything to the charge of God's elect? Then who can do anything to God's elect? What This is a, a great defense. If God has given us everything that we need, we have one of the greatest defenses in our life. The greatest defense attorney in our life that can argue our case. The greatest uh, defense in our life to provide everything that the world is trying to uh, do against us. That we have one in our defense against all the accusations of uh, of the world. In other words, the ideal of this, again, if you remember to deliver is to deliver one to the police so that justice would be uh, given. Jesus Christ took that role. And then he comes back and says, in this uh, sense, it's like you stand before a judge in a courtroom. And so you're standing there before the judge, uh, standing before the bench, and, 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 and here's what happens. As you're standing before the bench, uh, uh, the, the judge calls out and says, uh, uh, any accusers that want to accuse this one of any crime, this is uh, the ideal of this, any accuser that wants to uh, you know, you know, holler out or cry out against the, the crimes of this one, please approach the bench. And as you're standing there before the judge waiting on your accusers, there are none. There can be none. And that is the ideal of what is the Word of God here, is that we have this unwavering justification. We have this defense against the accusation that we don't open our mouths. It is not us that gives a defense. No, the challenge is presented. That's what it says. And look at what it says. Who shall lay? Notice this. He's calling it. If there is any that can lay any accusation against one that belongs to God. That's the, that's the language that is used there. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And so the judge has cried out, if there is one here that sees this one is guilty, bring the charges. And so we get to recognize the reality of accusation. For you see, the, uh, we're facing the world's uh, critiques. We're we're facing the world's uh, trials and, and tribulations. We're facing the evil of this world. You know why? Because there is an adversary. The Bible says there is an adversary. It is the enemy. And the enemy is an incessant accuser 
uh, uh, of mankind. And yet he cannot lay to the elect any accused that will stand before God. That ought to make you shout hallelujah. That there's nothing that the devil can say against you as a child of God, standing before God, that will hold it any way. Matter of fact, before God, the devil has to keep his mouth closed. Is there any? Is there, look at, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? No accusers. There are none. Why? Because the judge that sits on the seat has a divine verdict. And here is the divine verdict. For even if the devil wanted to, even and we know the devil could, and uh, here's what it says. But here the judgment comes from the judge. The judgment comes from the one that sits on the seat. And notice what he says in that verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? For here it is. It is God that justifies. It is God the one that says whether or not you are guilty. It is God the one that would drop the hammer. And so he says here, it is God that justifies. In other words, it is God that declares righteous. It is God that declares the one that is in, in right relationship. The authority that, the, uh, of the courtroom belongs to the judge. The authority of God's judgment. In other words, the judge, uh, God holds the final decree. So who can lay any charge uh, when you belong to God? For you see, we have the assurance of righteousness in Christ. Remember why I told you it's not your conduct, but it is in your position to be in Christ. So this is what being in Christ is all about. So that when I stand before the judge, I stand in Christ. I, I have been declared righteous in his sacrifice. It carries, the, carries us back to the cross. It carries us back to that divine plan. It carries us back to the cost of redemption. It carries us back to the intentionality of the judge who said we were going to be innocent when we stood before him because of Christ dying for you and I. And so we have this divine verdict of God. It is God who justifies. It is God who declares us righteous. Not the devil's accusation. Not the life that we have lived, but the blood of Jesus Christ, of the divine plan that God had. It is God that justifieth. Now notice this. It happens how? It happens uh, by grace. And we see the power of grace. What is, what is the word grace? What is the meaning of the word that, that is used here? Verse 33 goes on. It says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God? It is God that justifieth. It is, uh, it is him that offers the grace. The judge says, yeah, even if you were guilty, you're not guilty before my eyes. That is grace because the word grace means the, the, to, to cause someone to be released. If a judge shows someone grace, the, they are released. They are freed. They are made right. They are made just. And so you and I have this wonderful grace. This wonderful God's riches at Christ's expense that has been paid for you and I so that you and I can stand before the judge and that we can em embrace our identity. That we can celebrate our status as God's, now listen, not only as, as God's free one, but God's chosen one. That God has his people and we belong to him and, and God has granted us immunity. For you see, there is security in our standing to stand before and with the judge, with the judge on our side. We cannot lose the case for the judge is on our side. And so we have the security of the judge. We have security in our standing, knowing we are justified. That we have been granted the immunity from any accusation that could be hurled toward us. We're going to go a little deeper in this. That we, that we have been liberated and we are sustained by this wonderful love of the judge. And so we have the security in our standing. Which then allows in us to live in freedom. For you see, to stand before the judge and be guilty means that I would be in bonds. That I would be locked up. That the chains would be put on my hands and my feet. And I would be uh, carried off into a jail cell. But no, because the judge says uh, 
that I am not guilty, then I can live in freedom. I have, a, I have this justification, not only today, but every day of my life. The judge says that I am free every single day of my life. And so I have a, this freedom, this, this liberation that sustains me. And, and so I, I, I must embrace my identity and, and live in this freedom from if standing before the judge. Being guilty would be guilt and shame. And yet I don't have the guilt and shame because God has set me free. The judge has set me free so that I have been cleansed and I have been renewed by grace. And so I can bold on a journey, not of condemnation, but, but, but be bold in a journey of righteousness, to live my life in righteousness, to live my life striving to be holy, not condemned with head held down, not bound by the, the sins of my life, but cleansed and renewed and embarking on this journey toward righteousness every day of my life. Be ye holy that I can pursue holiness because the judge has set me free. I am living in freedom. Why is that? And here comes the best part. For you see, as I've been standing before the judge, my lawyer has been making the claims. There has been no accusations in my life that could come and hold water against the judge who already loves me. For you see, it was a partial court. It showed partiality in this court because the judge already loved me. But look at verse 34. As we get ready to close and partake of the Lord's Supper, look at verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Amen. The victorious intercession of Christ. For you see, I haven't had to utter a word for my defense. Matter of fact, it is the finality of salvation in my life. For you see, I have been sealed. In the courtroom of law, the documents have been signed of my innocence. The document has been signed by the blood of Jesus Christ, sealed by his life and by his death. It has literally been sealed by his death that I am set free and that I can stand strong. For you see, there is no condemnation in a position. And that position is in Christ. There is no condemnation in Christ. Matter of fact, I have this resounding victory. That if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you live a victorious life. As you stand before the judge who loves you. As Jesus Christ makes intercession for you. In this resounding victory, it says this. Who is he that condemneth? Who is he that condemneth? Where is the one that can condemn? For it is Jesus Christ who is arguing my case. It is Jesus Christ who has become my lawyer. For you see, the resurrection reality cries out that I have been set free not only from sin, but death of this world. It is Christ who makes intercession it is Christ, it says in that verse, in verse 34, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Here is, here is a judge, I mean, here is a, the lawyer that is making my case, and he has overcome everything that the world has thrown, even death, death on a cross, that he raised, and he is the epitome of what life is and freedom because he has overcome the death and grave. For you see, there is the significance of the resurrection. It is the foundation of our faith and our hope. For all those that had been crucified before Christ, none had rose out of the tomb. None had been placed in a tomb and in three days rose back and sat in the prominent place on the right hand of the Father. And yet Christ did that for you and I. So that he makes the intercession. The significance, here's what he says. So here is the evidence. The evidence is that I died, that I was placed in a tomb, that I was raised back to life, that I sat in the place of promise on the right hand of the Father. And I make the argument to the judge that this one, this one is not guilty. That one is not guilty. For you see, Jesus Christ 
has victory over sin, death, and the grave. And that is what he has given to us. It is the assurance that we have, this triumphant assurance that we can be in Christ who has overcome sin, death, and the grave and has given that to you and I by the blood that has been applied in our life. So that we have, uh, as we close, the assurance of intercession. So that Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father, the assurance of intercession, the position of the Savior. Look at it. Who is even at the right hand of God, uh, who, who, who in the courtroom sits in the prominent place beside the judge. Uh, Christ's sovereignty and his authority comes shining through. Here's what it says, that in the courtroom, he is high and above everything else. He is reigning as the supreme one in the courtroom. For you see, when Jesus speaks, everyone in the courtroom listens. For when Jesus speaks, everyone in the courtroom turns their eyes to Jesus. Why? Because He has the authority. He is the advocate. Everybody wants to know. He is the mediator. The eternal link. He is the eternal link between us and God. And so everyone wants to know what He's got to say. And so we have this promise of prayer for you and I. That Jesus makes intercession for us. That we have the comfort of Christ's care. Knowing when it says intercession that Jesus even prays for us. That Jesus utters prayers. And last Sunday we said this. That the Holy Spirit makes utterance when we don't even know what to pray. And now we find out not only the Holy Spirit, but Jesus prays also. And there is power in His intercession that helps us, strengthens us in our struggles and our petitions to Him. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? For you see, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. My prayer to you is this, or my question to you is this, do you know Jesus? Are you in Christ? If, if you stood before God today, do you know that you know that you know that you're set free? That you're free from the penalty of sin and death in this life because you have an advocate, Jesus Christ. And that divine plan that He had that Christ would die for you. Have you surrendered your life? Have you cried out to a holy God to give your life so that the day comes so that the day and the hour and the moment and the time come that you know, that you know, that you know that you've been saved. That God has set you free. If you haven't, then I ask you to listen to the still small voice of God. To come and to give your life. To cry out to a holy God. To recognize the sinner that you are, the sin in your life. That if truly you stood today, that you would say that I am guilty. For you see, there's no one that could cry for your case. But if you have Jesus, Jesus in your life, He'll cry for your case. Do you know Him? Would you come and know Him? Would you come give your life today? Would you come and find that grace and justification? That you can rest in that unwavering security of your salvation boldly and live this life in the liberated freedom of the enveloped envelopment of the arms of Jesus in your life. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this.